Good morning, students. Um, welcome to CS 110 Computing Class. I'm your moderator. This is Natasha Nyanja. Um, so our last session, in our last session, we were looking at information systems. We defined what an information system is. We, looked, we defined what data is, um, information, and we looked at different types of information systems that are used at um, different operational levels in an organization. So we'll now move on to talk about um, specialized information systems. And the first ones that we'll look at are the expert systems. Now, expert systems can only be developed using what we call artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is, um, so an artificial intelligence system is the people, procedures, hardware, software, data, and knowledge needed to develop um, a computer that displays the characteristics of intelligence. In short, trying to make a computer act like a human being. So artificial intelligence systems mimic the functions of the human brain. Expert systems are an applied area of artificial intelligence. An expert system is a knowledge-based system having two main components, the knowledge base and the inference engine. So it uses a knowledge base to store relevant information, data, rules, cases, and relationships. And the inference engine gets information and relationships from the knowledge base and provides answers and predictions the way a human expert does. For example, let's think about um, a health expert system. Now, that health expert system, we imagine that its knowledge base has knowledge on maybe two or three diseases. So we give it um, knowledge on malaria, knowledge on TB, and um, knowledge on um, another disease. It means we're going to store all the symptoms, if you take, for example, malaria, all the symptoms that fall under malaria and we're going to store it in the knowledge base. We're going to also store um, some rules and cases. Such that for the inference engine to work, it will look at the knowledge that's in the knowledge base. So if someone comes to this um, expert system, the health expert system, and gives out their symptoms, I have a headache, my temperature is high, I have, 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 I have fever, based on the combination of symptoms given, the expert system will use the inference engine. How will it use it? It will get to combine the different symptoms given by the human being and based on relationships that are maintained in the knowledge base, it will act the way a human expert would work. To say, based on these symptoms that you've given, it will conclude on whether you have malaria or not. That's just one way in which expert systems can be used. The next type of um, specialized information system is an enterprise resource planning system. An ERP system is a computer software system that manages and coordinates all the resources, information and functions of a business from shared data stores. ERP systems are integrated programs that manage all business operations. For example, they coordinate the planning, the inventory control, production and ordering. ERP systems integrate functions such as human resources, supply chain management, um, customer relationship, relations management, financial, manufacturing functions, and warehouse management functions. So to bring this home, instead of having multiple systems in an organization, so for example, the human resource a department has their own system, um, the purchasing a department has their own system, an enterprise resource system is used to bring all those things together by using only one system to do all those functions. The next one is, an, is electronic commerce. So electronic commerce is also a specialized type of information system. It involves any business transaction executed electronically between parties. It uses the internet and web for doing business. 
the best example or the most common one that you've had is how you operate on um, how you purchase stuff on eBay or Amazon. So because for you to transact, you have to do it electronically. We consider that electronic commerce. And it's a specialized type of uh, information system. So it uses services like email, workflow software tools, intranet, and the e-payment services. So you agree with me that when you go to eBay or Amazon, you select the item you want to buy, there is no way you meet up with anyone to give them cash. There is a way in which you can have funds move from your account to the person, to the seller's account electronically. So there is no need to meet physically or to meet in person. Everything is done electronically. E-commerce can also be considered to involve buying and selling of products and services electronically. So as already given, the best example, the biggest example is buying and selling of goods on eBay or Amazon and nowadays even on Facebook. We'll now move on to talk about um, processing methods. So at this level, we are aware that all computers perform three general tasks. That is input, they process data, then they produce output. So within this broad framework, the ways in which we can use computers to perform various tasks can be broken down into different categories. The processing can be real-time, it can be online, or it can be batch. So the first thing we'll look at is the batch processing. So in a typical batch processing environment, large volumes of data are received at a centralized data processing department, usually in the form of typed or handwritten forms. So these um, source documents are then counted into batches of say 50 or 100 and entered into the computer, be held on a transaction file until they can be processed. Batch processing is often carried out on mainframe com uh, computers, which are also being used for real-time processing. So since there is generally no immediate agency for batch, for a batch of data to be processed, this is often done at night when the computer would otherwise be idle. Typical applications of um, batch processing include payroll and billing systems. The next type of processing that we'll look at is real-time processing. Real-time systems are online interactive systems for controlling critical operations in real time. That is, while events occur. This type of system helps airlines to be operated efficiently. Such reservation systems require powerful communication-oriented computers supporting a network of terminals dealing with inquiries and seat reservations, which are immediately updated in the master file. So we continue looking at real-time systems. The primary objectives of the system are to provide instant information on demand. And also, real-time processing means that the computer has to keep pace with some external operation, process the data that it receives more or less instantly and produce immediate results. So in a way, we can think of real-time systems as online systems, but with tighter constraints on response time and availability. Real-time systems, are used in a variety of situations, and generally speaking, fall into one of two categories. They are either used for process control or they're used for information storage and retrieval. Under process control, what are they used for? So process control involves the control of machinery or industrial processes by means of a computer. What do we mean? Sensors continuously monitor data such as temperature, pressure, composition of substances, and so on, and the computer reacts accordingly. So feedback is an essential element in most control systems. Timing considerations are often critical 
And the term real-time control system is sometimes used to indicate this. Information retrieval, information storage and retrieval. So a different type of real-time system is one in which a single user or a number of users needs to be able to make queries and update information held in a file. An example would be stock control systems, where as soon as a sale is made, the invoice is printed out and the appropriate amount deducted from the quantity in stock. Another example would be a, a library system where books borrowed are immediately recorded as being housed to a particular person. What are some characteristics of a real-time system? So you will note that in a real-time system, a small amount, a small volume of data is involved at any one time. Why? Because the response has to be instant. So the processing has to be fast and the response has to be instant. So a small volume of data is involved at any one time. Also, the turnaround time is critical, meaning the time it takes from the time you issue an instruction to the time you get the result. The time, that time is critical. The third thing is the processing efficiency is subordinate to response need. The next one is that the system responds to and often controls its environment. So feedback is essential and processing must keep pace with external events. As with the example of sensors, once a system, a real-time system picks up that a certain sensor has picked up this information, it has to send that um, reading very fast such that feedback is sent back and it reacts accordingly. If the temperature is 100, react like this. It means when the temperature is 100, it has to send feedback and then react the way it has been programmed. The last characteristic is that high availability is required. Such systems have to be available all the time. The next type of processing we'll talk about is interactive processing. This is another term used to mean that data is processed upon entry and output produced immediately. The next type of processing is online processing. So a fast response, a fast response time often demands the implementation of an online system. So for real time processing, the input device, um, which may be a terminal, barcode reader, a device to read the magnetic, mag magnetic strip on a credit card, must be online to the computer. That is connected to the computer and, be, and able to access information or on the computer. So the term online is also applied to files of data held on backing storage such as, such as disk. If a file is online, it is accessible at that particular time through a program currently running it. In this case, data stored on a flash, which is lying on your desk, is considered offline because no one can use that data until the flash is connected to a computer. Whereas once the flash is connected to the computer, whatever information is on it can be considered online because then we can use it. The next type of processing is a centralized processing. So in the 1960s, when none of us were here, when computers were began to be widely used in business and commerce, the trend was to have a centralized data processing department with men from computer, and the staff of system analysts, programmers, system operators, and other data processing staff. So all data would be sent to this department for input and processing, and the reports would be sent back to the department originating the request. So I don't know how many of you have seen um, the Hidden Figures movie, but let me describe the scenario in there. So if we are using centralized processing, for example, at CBU, and we picked Computer Lab 1 as the central place where all data processing will be happening. It means if anyone, any other department within CPU needed data to be processed, they would send it to Computer Lab 1 for it to be processed. Computer Lab 1 is one that would be filled with the mainframe computer, 
system analysts, programmers, computer operators, and all people that are required to process that data. And whatever data has to be processed will be sent there. Once it's processed, the result would then be sent to the department that sent the request. Another type of um, processing is distributed processing. So a distributed system is one in which there are several autonomous but interacting processes and all data stores at different geographical locations. In a distributed system, processing is carried out independently in more than one location, but with shared and controlled access to some common facilities, which normally include file storage and information resources. So examples of distributed systems include networks, which is local area networks and wide area networks. Some of the advantages of distributed, uh, distributing the processing include there's reduction in costs and delays in transmitting and processing data. So unlike having processing in one place, where everyone has to come from wherever they are to come to that place for processing. We're saying distributed processing reduce, um, causes a reduction in costs and delays in transmitting and processing data. It also reduces the load on the host. It is with distributed processing, there's better local control and service. So that marks the end of um, Unit 12. Again, for this, this presentation, let me insist that all these presentations are summarized versions of your notes. For, for details, additional details, please refer to your notes. Go through your notes, go through your tutorials if available to gain more understanding on what has been discussed. Thank you so much for your time. Please enjoy the rest of your day.